Okay, this is um, an oral history interview with Elizabeth Baker, Republican, from the 82nd District, Kansas. I'm Sarah Tucker. Have you not seen that? <laughs> Representative Baker is looking at her Xerox picture in the legislative handbook um, page on her. Let me start out by asking you how you came first to get involved in politics. It was a long time ago. <clears throat> um, I was teaching school at Rose Hill Middle okay. School in Rose Hill, Kansas, and was very active in KNEA uh, and served as president and served as chief negotiator for a number of years and became more and more politically aware as to the role the state played in regard to funding education. And at the same time, I lived in Derby and was active in, in the community there, uh, church and sports activities with my children, and um, served on the library board for six years, and um, eventually was elected to the city council in Derby and served on the city council. And it was at that time that some people approached me about running for the legislature in Derby. We'd never had a Republican representative from the community. It was a, it was a Democratic district. And they wanted a Republican, because they were all Republicans, and so we decided to take on the challenge. Um, tell me, Derby is close to Wichita? Derby is southeast Sedgwick County. Okay. Uh, it's a rapidly growing community. It has 15,000. Mm -hmm. When I moved there, it had about five. This was 25 years, 25 years ago, maybe. <coughs> maybe 4,000, I don't know. It has a very high um, income level. In fact, it's one of the highest of the cities of the second class in the state. It's uh, uh, very similar to the cities in Johnson County. Some of those are next um, But in addition to the Derby area, there, I, in my legislative district, I have an area outside of Derby that uh, is very uh, low socioeconomic level, very poor area that's just outside of Wichita that's never been annexed. That's an improvement district that was established um, in World War II. Hmm. It has um, Asian gangs and some serious problems in it. Um, tell me, why are you a Republican? <coughs> it's uh, genetic. Um, um, my grandparents were Republican. My great grandparents were Republican. Um, my I was I was raised by my grandparents in a, a bigoted atmosphere towards both Democrats and Catholics. Oh dear, they were. Uh, lumped into a category of disgust. And I was not allowed to date Catholics when I was growing up. I wasn't allowed to play with the Catholic boys up the street. Um, and Democrats were the same way. When, when I was in the fourth grade, I had been told that Democrats chewed cigars, or smoked cigars and swore, or chewed tobacco. And I was downtown on my bike, and I saw a man on the street, and I heard him swearing, and I'd never heard anybody swear before in my life, and I saw him smoking a cigar, and I rode the bike all the way home to tell my grandmother that I had seen my first Democrat. <laughs> Third grade, maybe, I can't remember. But I do remember the experience and seeing him standing there. Um, <clears throat> where was this that you were growing up? Winfield, Kansas. Winfield, Kansas. And how did you come to be brought up by your grandparents? Well, my... Uh, father disappeared just before I was born. Mm -hmm. My mother um, taught school for 36 years in Winfield, but my mother has not been well, mm -hmm. um, both physically and emotionally. What did your um, grandparents do? Uh, was your grandmother a homemaker? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd been farmers. Mm -hmm. So it was what? one might call a traditional family in terms of gender roles. Mm, yeah, yes, pretty much, pretty much. Um, going back then to you being the, the designated Republican to run out of uh, Derby, 
Well, when you, let me let me ask them. Yeah. You might get a kick out of this. I'm the fifth generation of college graduate women in my family, and I don't think many people can say that. Indeed. How my great grandmother was at the University of Wisconsin, where she met my great grandfather, um, and I think that was like in the 18. Well, it had to be in the 1870s. Okay. Um, and her father and mother were out of New York, and they'd gone, she went to Holyoke. So it's not, you know, I'm not first generation woman activist, so to speak. My great grandmother is listed as one of the founders of the Sumner County Schools. Hmm. It's kind of, kind of different. So what kind of image of what women did in the world did you get out of this mixed we were, family background? I, I, I think that we were, I was expected to be active as a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was probably the message. That's interesting. It is. So, this was 1982 election that you got recruited to run for the legislature. Did you have a primary fight? Yes. Oh, no, in 1982, no. I was thinking of this last time. No, I didn't have one. Okay. I ran against, um, <clears throat> it was an open seat. The man had um, had had, uh, had a heart attack and died in a car wreck. He was Ooh. a pretty popular individual. And his wife had taken his position, and then she didn't choose to run. And so the seat was open. and. Um, I ran against a former mayor of the community, a, a man that was much older than I was, that mm -hmm. had been there for a long time. Why do you think he won? I worked harder. <laughs> I knocked on more doors. I went through the town twice. I went through the whole district very, very thoroughly. How did you know what to do? Who helped you? Who helped you do the strategy for this first campaign? Um, I had... Uh, a very close girlfriend that, that she and I had negotiated together on Rose Hill, and we had worked in Congressman Bob Whitaker's campaigns, and she had left Rose Hill. We had, there was a, a women's support group that's still together for the most part, but they um, <coughs> we got our masters together, and um, she went to work for Bob Whitaker as his aide, and she was the one that really outlined what I had to do and. On, and how to do it, and you know how many mailers did we have to do, and how many yard signs, and how many big signs, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Then I had some real good support from the community too. Some, okay. some my uh, listed campaign manager uh, has been jokingly referred to as the Godfather of Derby. So. Okay, so you had personal support and also <coughs> sort of Republican, yes, old line support. Did you have any trouble raising enough money to do the campaign? Uh, yes, I didn't have enough money. I um, I used some of my own lung, lung myself. So. I've heard that before. Um, you won. How how much did you win by? Fifty one percent to forty nine percent. You won. Um, when you came up to Topeka for the first session, did you have any image of? what the job was going to be, what strategy you were going to use, how you were going to learn to do it? No, to be quite frank with you, I was uh, extremely naive about the process. I, I felt like I had a, a better understanding than I did. I didn't. How did you go about learning how to do it? I had a very good office mate, Keith Rowe from Mankato. Okay. He represents Smith Osborne and Jewel County up there. And, and, uh, he uh, was extremely helpful in telling me how to organize the office and how to be very responsive to constituents and just basically said what you've got to do is work very hard and showed me how. Um, did you have certain committees you wanted to be on? Did you get them? Uh, I wanted to be on education and I couldn't be because I was a teacher and a Republican and they don't put teachers that are Republicans on education committees. Why not? <coughs> because they would have a tendency to vote for teacher issues rather than board-oriented issues. So 
I wasn't allowed on there, and they put me on insurance instead, mm -hmm. and uh, which I knew nothing about at all. And I served one year and was thrown off the committee because I kept voting with the Democrats. Where did you go I, next? <laughs> I, well, I sat there in, in committees. I didn't know anything about insurance at all. Uh -huh. I sat and listened to the testimony and tried to be a very responsible legislator. And every time I listened to this, it just seemed to me that the insurance companies were lining their pockets. Uh, <laughs> it just makes sense to me. It didn't seem to be a very consumer-oriented group. I've heard that before. <laughs> so. I kept voting. I, I had, I, I shouldn't say I didn't have any Republican support as I did. I had some Republicans that used to tell me outside of the committee that I was doing what was right and to hang in there, but I was removed from the committee after one year. Um, and then yeah. um, Mike Hayden uh, wanted to make it up to me. He decided I was really all right, and so he turned around and put me on education, which was a first. Ah. Now, you're not on education anymore, if I got that right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why not? Did you elect to go off? Mm -hmm. um, they formed the Economic Development mm -hmm. Committee, and I became very interested in that and started serving on that. And um, Jim Braden made me uh, vice chair of elections about the same time. So I had to make a decision in there. and. To be quite frank, I was getting a little bit um, burned out on sitting through the education meetings. It was so much of a rehash of everything mm -hmm. I'd heard for so many years that I wanted to taste something new. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, one of the, the things we're interested in is how you feel about how things work around here. And I've heard some people say they think committees are the heart of the process. I've heard people say that committees aren't the heart of the process anymore. Do you have a sense of the importance of committees to the legislature? Um, yes, I do. And I think, yes, committees are the heart of the process. Um, I think you have, as a result of so many new members in the legislature, a lack of understanding of that and a lack of knowledge and the importance of relying upon committees for information. Um, so many times now, a bill will get out of committee and you have people just going in all different directions uh, on the floor without relying on the judgment of the people in committee. So if anything... Not working yeah. as a team. Mm -hmm. So if anything, you would like to see it go back to where... I'd like to see people have a, an understanding of the importance of it. Okay. <clears throat> As you look back on what's almost 10 years now um, in the legislature, are there some bills you sponsored, introduced, one lost that seemed particularly memorable to you? No, I'm not, not off the top of my head. If you then looked in general at the 10 years in, in terms of what's happened, what you've accomplished, uh, what do you see as the high points or even low points if there was a big fight you lost that you really regret? Probably, probably the <clears throat> most dramatic thing that happened to me was um, I was vice chair of elections, which I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. and Jim Braden was speaker of the House, and Joe Knopf was majority leader. Joe Knopf was from Manhattan, and um, we had a vote that was coming up on the floor on education that affected the Wichita School District. And Joyce Boach, who was a board member down there, a longtime board member and a close friend of mine, called me and asked me if I would support the, this additional money going into education. And I, had, <coughs> I said, yes, I would. Um, 
I won't go into all the background on it, but we had taken this boat the day be twice before, the day before and, and the day preceding that, when it came up again on the floor, and it was there was going to be a motion to concur again on the Senate amendments that had put the money back in. And that was the vote that Joyce wanted me to vote yes on. And I had done it repeatedly, and the motion had failed the two preceding days because <coughs> they didn't have enough Republican votes. She called me that morning and asked me, would I hang tough one more time? And I said, well, certainly, Joyce. I made this commitment. And I had just gotten off the phone talking to her, and I was called down to Jim Braden's office, and he and Joe Knopf were in there. And they said that they wanted my vote on that concur and on concur. And I said, I can't do that because I've already promised the board member in Wichita. And Joe said, if you don't vote this way today, you're going to be pulled from your leadership position. And I have a really hot temper. I, and I said, fine, gentlemen, you do whatever you think you have to do. And I got it walked out. Well, I didn't realize that they had called all the Republicans in that had voted that way the day before and had voted the same way as I and yanked and told them all that they had to change their votes. There was some kind of a power play on their part. So the vote came up on the floor and I was the only one, the only Republican that voted with the Democrats. And I was called in the office right afterwards and pulled as vice chairman. Well what happened as a result of it was Jim Braden just was blasted over it. Joe Knox was just crucified over it. The papers did the numbers on him. Um, the, the people on the floor got together and bought me like a $70 basket of flowers and had it on my desk that afternoon. And at the KNEA wrote a resolution at their assembly, which was meeting the following week here in Topeka. And I, I don't know how many letters Jim got, but he got hundreds and hundreds of letters from teachers across the state who were just incensed that something like that would be done. So it was kind of a turning point for me. I was <coughs> All of a sudden, I had the independence that I had wanted. People could no longer uh, try to, people no longer ever have tried to manipulate me since. <laughs> that was the last of that. That's a striking so, story. Well, it was kind of wild. <laughs> um, which really leads into something which sums up a lot of what we're interested in. Um, in your general experience, do you think it's made a difference to be a woman in terms of choosing to run, how you run, how you're perceived here, how you have to operate, what issues you stand for? I think with the public in general that they really like women candidates, that they have a lot more confidence in us than they do in men. Uh, but, and, and I think it's because of a, a natural trust in uh, women. Uh, that comes from their mothers, <laughs> and yeah. and that uh, they view politicians uh, with so much disfavor. I mean, they don't like politicians. Most people don't. My book here, the um, My American Hate Politics. <laughs> I better read it. Good. <laughs> um, they. I think that the public likes us as candidates. Mm -hmm. I think once you're here that you have a hard time moving up because of, of um, mm, jealousy from males, um, the feeling that they don't want to see a woman get ahead of them, that kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I do believe it does. I really believe it exists. I don't think it's something that's imagined. I think it's real. But the men themselves uh, spend a lot of time scrabbling to get to the top in this arena. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the ones that are unable to make uh, are unable to make it or unable to achieve a level of uh, of importance you could pick out around here because they're always the ones that are involved in uh, oh, uh, complaining and you know attacking the whoever's in power. You saw it this week. Yes. Um. To go back for a minute to the personal side of your life. You told me about your early childhood, brought up by your grandparents. Um, you have children, therefore, I assume you got married. <laughs> Could you kind of um, 
describe um, the personal side of how you do this job as a legislator. You have children. How old were they when you first ran for the legislature? Oh, both of them. See, I had my kids when I was 20 years old. Huh. My kids were, um, the last one was in college at K-State, and the oldest one was getting out of college when I started up here, so they were grown. Okay. Um, so that wasn't really a problem for us. You are currently married to Lee Kinch. Mm -hmm. um, how do you manage a family in Wichita and being up here in Topeka? Do you come up weekly? Do you, do you know about what my husband does? Well, I would like you to tell me. <laughs> my husband is chairman of the Cedric County Democratic Party. A striking characteristic for the husband of a Republican woman. And he is the most liberal of the liberals <laughs> that you probably would ever want to meet. An extremely tolerant man really enjoys what I do um, uh, until I make comments like Democrats have dog drool all over them like I did last week, which upset <laughs> me enormously and said it was the most tasteless thing I had ever said. Well, surely that was in response to a particular development in Kansas <laughs> politics as opposed to a general statement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> This is unusual. Um, how did the two of you come to get together? Well, um, well, you really ask tough questions. Don't answer anything you don't want to answer. When I first ran for the legislature, some people in my district, because Bob Whitaker, who used to represent our area until uh, the year before I ran or something, they were fortunate. And he came over and endorsed me. He was very popular. And he came over in September before the election and endorsed me. And uh, but he'd never done that. And the opposition, plus a group of people in the community that were concerned about another issue that had to do with paving a road, decided to do a recall petition on me when I was running for city council. Hmm. And they started this recall petition in the end of September before the election in November, okay? And I didn't know what to do about it. Mm -hmm. And in visiting with my friend that was helping me, Claudette, that worked for Bob Whitaker, uh, we decided I needed to seek the advice of an attorney. Well, the only attorney either one of us knew was Lou Kinch. We didn't know any attorneys in Wichita because Lee had represented KNEA on um, due process hearings across mm -hmm. the state. So I went to see him and that's how I met him. And obviously found a lot in common with him. Well, um, there's a whole other story to this that I won't bore you with, Sarah, that goes on and on and on. It's quite unusual. But <laughs> Um, if I can just get one thing straight, obviously then he is your second husband, or no, no, he's, actually he's my third husband. He's your third husband. Okay. So you had married, had some children. The marriage had ended. So. Well, my my first husband was adjudicated for insanity in the Cedric County courts and was incarcerated in Warren for long periods of time. My children's father. Hmm. And um, it was. Um, it was a very traumatic period in, our, in my life. And I was married to him for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I thought that marriage, I finally had the strength to get out of the marriage. Mm -hmm. I was single for a whole, probably five years. And I met my second husband and was extremely lonely, which I guess is the only excuse I could Use. I knew in three months and then mm. it, was, it was a really big mistake, big mistake. Well, the only reason other than a hole in the record to ask this is whether this kind of experience um, had anything to do with the growing feminism, whether you already had it before. Certainly some women say when they discover marriages end is when they begin to realize women need to be more active in the public sphere, need to have more I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't okay. think that was my case. Okay. Um, I don't think that was my case. It sounds like you kind of had that perception already. Uh, I think I did. Yeah. I, I, 
there was a lot of things about the way I was raised that was very unstable. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it took me a while after I got on my own, I think, to get the stability and the strength that I needed to go on with my life. Because I just had to mature. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Well, I, don't, I don't think it was a growing feminism or a growing awareness. Just making it through life. Um, you then go home to Wichita, Derby, week, weekends, and you live up here in, in Topeka. Mm -hmm. And since you don't have children at home, that probably works out. How do you manage the fact that Kansas legislators are not paid a huge salary? Is there a big financial burden to this? There is a tremendous burden if uh, you are single or by yourself. I have the good fortune of having a, a very uh, um, supportive husband mm -hmm. that is quite well able to take care of everything. So okay. I don't have those problems. But Do you teach um, when a mm -hmm. No. So my, my husband is a very good trial lawyer, Sarah. So he's done well. You have the luxury of being able to provide mm -hmm. public service. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you are thinking of running for the Senate. Mm -hmm. I've already announced. You've already announced. In October. Um, why is that? Why are you changing from the House to the Senate? Uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, my constituents down there have a feeling that um, uh, people, incumbents in office stay there too long. And uh, you see, you see a lot of this across the nation, like putting term limitations on. Mm -hmm. And they, they really feel that uh, you need some a new voice up there and some changes. And I, I support that. I don't support uh, putting term limitations on. But I do think that there need, we, if we're going to keep a citizens' legislature, that we need to uh, keep turning things around, keep some new voices going in various areas. Um, and I also feel like I want a new challenge. I, uh -huh. I want something else to do. Uh, and I think the Senate will give me that opportunity. Um, you mentioned when we were talking earlier that indeed the Senate is um, only having to run every once every four years, and also that you are one of 40. Well, I now you mentioned once every four years. Yes, I did. You did. Um, That's not really a concern. It isn't a concern? No. It always seems to me that you have to spend so much time running for election. Well, see, I believe the only way that we're accountable is through the, okay. that elective process. I, there's been a lot of movement up here to move uh, representatives to a four-year term, and I, I don't buy that. Okay. I don't find anything wrong with this, having to go back and answer. Okay. So... I think it's healthy. <clears throat> what else is there about the Senate? that you find to be a challenge? The, the one in 40. The one in 40? Is, is a lot different than one in 125. Okay. Um, are you going to have to change the way you um, run for election? Is there a different style to running in a larger Senate district? It depends on what the district mm -hmm. is. If I have a lot of rural area, I'm going to have to adapt my style to that. Tell me about the seat you're running for. Is it going to be open? Um, That's nobody knows for nobody sure. Nobody knows for sure. Right now, Kitty Francisco is the senator, okay. and he lives many, many miles away from me. The district's in an L shape, and he's at the top of the L, and I'm at the toe of the L. And it's the fifth fastest growing district in the state, so it's going to see some remarkable changes. It's got, it just has to. Okay. So you're not quite sure what it's going to be like, but you're going to mm -hmm. do it. Yeah. Might as well. Um, they won't split Derby up. That'll be one thing. Okay. How has it affected you and your family to be in the legislature for 10 years? Have there been costs? What are the gains? Well, um, my husband and I are, are both political junkies. Um, so we spend a lot of time discussing politics, reading books. Mm -hmm. like this, um, and, and we're extremely close because of it. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm not certain how, you know, my, both my children are grown. One lives in Georgia, the other one lives in Manhattan. The one in Manhattan has been 
active to a certain extent. Um, and he, has come, he comes over to the Capitol and participates in things and goes to inaugurals and has, has enjoyed being involved in it. But he was raised, you know, passing out flyers for local elections mm -hmm. at home. Um, they both were. I'm not sure that it's, I'm not sure how it's impacted us. Everybody seems to be quite happy with it, except my 81-year-old mother. It's not quite, she thinks that I've reached the age that I probably ought to come home. <laughs> Gee, I'm not sure 81 should have to come home, let alone her daughter. <laughs> um, is there something you'd like to get on the record? Is there something I haven't asked you thought I would? Um, No, not really, except you haven't probed uh, the differences between Republicans and Democrats. Love to hear anything you say. Uh, very much. I, my impression is that you are what I would call a liberal Republican. Well, I call myself a moderate or a progressive. Okay. To me, liberal is not a bad term. But <laughs> um, you sound like my husband. <laughs> That's right. He loves liberal. Well, of course, as a historian, I could give a short dissertation on the evolving term liberal, but what would you say is the difference between Republicans and Democrats? Well, in Kansas, it's, uh, it's very interesting because um, you have, on the Democratic side of the aisle, you have um, some upper socioeconomic level Democrats that are very well educated that are really uh, academics that are very similar to my husband. Mm -hmm. And then you also have the lower socioeconomic level uh, Democrat over there with very little education, uh, which is pretty, pretty much like, I think, what I've read about overall Democrats, that they have a lot of the very high and the very low. Mm -hmm. And the Republicans, on the other hand, have a lot of middle class. We are very solidly middle class on our side of the aisle, which I think is interesting. Upper middle class, middle class, upper middle class. So there aren't any poor Republicans? But there aren't any poor Republicans? Or? Yeah, some, but not, not, not too many. <coughs> not very good. So, Sometimes Republican women and Democratic women almost compete, and mm -hmm. you're suggesting the Democratic mm -hmm. women see Republican women as competitors. Mm -hmm. There was a furor over a bill that Republican women introduced. <coughs> uh, we introduced a bill that made barring access to a medical facility a felony, and it was done just with a group of Republicans on it. Now, there was a few Republican men on there, but it was mostly Republican women. And they were strong out of Central County. Well, we, I had talked to the Democratic uh, women uh, about that bill, and we did it this last fall. It wasn't something that was sprung on the, on the uh -huh. mean spring on. We did it in response to the uh, tactics of Operation Rescue in yeah. Wichita, and we were receiving considerable pressure from Republicans for choice in Wichita for us to take a stand. Yes. And so we said, okay. And I had told them about it. Well, they forgot about it when the bill was introduced up here. They said we were trying to upstage them and that we were, you know, jumping the gun, I guess. Uh -huh. and, and we hadn't meant that at all. We were just trying yeah. to get out front and say, hey, here's where we are and we're going to be just, and it all backfired. It all blew up. Everybody was upset over it and angry. And it's too bad when that happened. So really and truly from what you're saying, women in the legislature do not really operate as a block very often. They're more likely to operate in the context of where you're from and what party you're in. So, I don't, I, Sarah, That's too I, complicated. I I, it's just too complicated. Okay. But right now, the women are, are very united in this bill that we have. It yes. deals with abortion. It has all the issues, the compromise bill, we, we, we call it. Mm -hmm. It has all the issues you want, and we're all united in it. There are constantly things that are happening that could cause some of us to break off, that we're trying to make sure we all stay together. It's, it, it's, a, it's a real difficult thing. But I think that's the way it is with any time you're trying to build consensus and keep people going in the same direction, maybe. I don't know. So it'd be more accurate to say it's one factor that you're winning, yes. another factor that you're whatever party, etc. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much.